by human decision and action. It's to say that there is reason to believe that the course of events can be influenced by human decision and action. Now, if you take, uh, for example, the hurricane problem, which we're all aware of these days because it's so much in the newspapers, uh, the hurricane problem uh, is one in which you can conceive of uh, alternative courses of events. You can conceive of a uh, situation where you keep on having hurricanes and a situation where you don't have any more hurricanes. Uh, it's clearly uh, uh, preferable in terms of, of human uh, experience, uh, human welfare, that there should not be any hurricanes. Nonetheless, uh, the hurricane problem is not an ethical problem because we don't know how to stop having hurricanes. The population is an ethical problem because we think we know how to stop having babies. Now, if you apply these criteria, these three criteria, uh, to the population dilemma, I think we can say that there are at least three dimensions of the population crisis which are broadly ethical in character. And I propose to call these this morning the quantitative dimension, the qualitative dimension, and the distribution dimension of the problem. The qualitative dimension, uh, excuse me, the quantitative dimension, the qualitative dimension, and the distribution dimension of the problem. Let's look at each of these in a little detail. First of all, then, the quantitative dimension. It's easy to see that uh, considering the population dilemma purely as a quantitative problem, and that's how it customarily is approached in the literature, uh, that, the, that the three criteria which we mentioned, the three criteria of an ethical problem, are all present. In the first place, there are two readily conceivable alternatives. If you project into the, into the future, uh, you can readily conceive of two possibly different kinds of worlds uh, that might result. One possibility is that world population will continue to grow at roughly the present rate until the point is reached where the natural checks to population, namely disease and famine and the quasi-natural check of war, where disease, famine, and war once again establish some kind of equilibrium. As you know by now, for thousands and thousands of years prior to the modern era, these checks kept world population at a fairly constant figure of around one half billion persons. With modern methods of food production and disease control, it's obvious that the earth can be made to support many times that number of people. Thus you have the present rapid rise in world population. But even with our present knowledge and technology, there obviously is some limit to the number of persons that the earth can support. Eventually, if world population continues to increase, that limit will be reached. Uh, as a matter of fact, we have a historical precedent for this. Uh, Harrison Brown, in his uh, book, which has already been mentioned to you, The Challenge of Man's Future, which I regard as an excellent, uh, an excellent study, and one which I hope many of you will take the opportunity to read. Harrison Brown has pointed out that, that uh, a, a, a previous, uh, that an analogy to the present situation is one when mankind, when man learned to stay in roughly the same place and to raise his crops. Uh, the number of people that the earth could support simply by, by hunting and by fishing was a very small number. When man learned to, to raise crops, the earth could suddenly support a larger number, and so the population rose to about the half billion level. Now, I'm saying that with our present disease control and, and agricultural technology, the earth can support many, many times uh, the, the number of people uh, that it did support up till the modern era, and even many times its present number. But there is some limit 
There is some finite number of persons that the earth can support. And eventually, if the population continues to increase, uh, that limit will be reached. And when it is reached, if this is the direction that we take, then world population will once again level off with high birth rates and equally high death rates. Now, in such a world, which could contain perhaps as many as one or two hundred billion persons, there would not be enough land space for everyone. So a substantial number of people, a uh, few billion, uh, present world population is three billion, let's say maybe 30 or 40 billion people in that day would have to live on man-made floating islands. The vast majority of mankind would have to live on algae and other relatively unpalatable foods that can be produced in a minimum of space. In such d conditions, disease would almost inevitably be commonplace. Hunger would be inevitable, and strife of various kinds would, be, would have to be expected. To an outside observer, this kind of a world would look very much like a miserable carcass covered with a teeming mass of maggots. Only the maggots would be your descendants and mine. Now, between the present time and the achievement of, of natural equilibrium, a number of things would undoubtedly occur. First, there would inevitably be a great deal of international war, uh, which might conceivably put an end to the whole problem. Uh, the reason for, for this uh, is that famine which would be inevitable in this kind of a world, has always been one of the prominent causes of war. Secondly, the world's natural resources would one by one be exhausted, making impossible anything like the industrial civilization or the machine civilization that we know today. It has already been predicted, for example, that copper will be com that, the, that the world's available supply of copper uh, will be completely exhausted uh, before the end of the present century, that the chief copper mines uh, of the 21st century will be the junk piles of the presently industrialized nations. Uh, other metals would be totally exhausted within two or three centuries, petroleum within at most the next 1,000 years. Man's industry, therefore, would have to adapt itself to the use of the only relatively inexhaustible uh, resources that the earth affords, namely seawater, air, ordinary rock, sedimentary deposits of limestone and phosphate rock, and sunlight. Finally, mankind's pattern of life would obviously uh, tend to become uh, more and more uniform. It would be characterized by a minimum of mobility, because there isn't any room to move around, relatively little space per person, and very little activity in order to conserve energy. These would be the rule for the life of every man. Now this is one possible course of events. The other possibility, the other possibility is for man to establish an artificial equilibrium at a much lower level of world population. It's inevitable that equilibrium is going to be established sometime in some way. Man, however, has it within his power it is, it is within the power of man, at least the possibility can be conceived of, of establishing an artificial equilibrium at a much lower level of world population. If, for example, world population could be stabilized at, say, six or seven billion, which is about double the present figure, 
there is no reason why, in principle at least, such a population could not be decently fed and clothed and housed and educated and medicated at levels comparable to those that now prevail in Western Europe and the United States. Such a population, if stabilization were really achieved, could not only live on the earth, but could live the good life. In such a world, the benefits of industrialization could eventually be made available to all people. Now, these then are the two conceivable alternatives. And so far as I know, there is no argument about which of these alternatives is morally preferable. The only question is, can man really bring about the latter alternative? Can man establish an equilibrium of plenty before nature catches up with man's industry and once again establishes an equilibrium of suffering and need? What can man do? Uh, it's important to realize here, I think, that, that, the, that the time in which the, the uh, latter alternative can be realized is rapidly going away. If you read your yesterday's paper, you may have noted that the present population of India is some 400 and uh, either 430 or 460 million persons, and that it's growing at the rate of about 11 million persons a year. Uh, another way of looking at this is to say that during the last four days since you heard your first lecture of the present series on the world population crisis, during these four days, the population of the world has increased uh, by some over half a million persons, some, somewhat more than the total population of the city of Minneapolis. See, that is how fast world population is growing. Now, theoretically, there are two ways to establish population equilibrium, two, two ways to establish an artificial equilibrium with uh, relatively equal birth rates and death rates. One is to increase the death rate, and the other is to decrease the birth rate. It's just like your family budget, you know. There are two ways to balance it. One is to cut down on spending, the other is to increase your income. The problem there is that neither of them work. Now, increasing the death rate, increasing the death rate is obviously not a morally acceptable alternative. Although, as a matter of fact, it has been practiced by various societies in such forms as infanticide and the liquidation of selected groups such as the aged, the sick, the deformed, and the retarded. Practically, however, the only moral option for establishing artificial equilibrium is to somehow decrease the birth rate. And for this purpose, four alternatives are available. These are, first, abortion. Secondly, sterilization. Thirdly, contraception. And fourthly, delayed marriage. Japan, as you know, has adopted a policy of legalized abortion. And in so doing, has drastically reduced its birth rate during the past decade. As recently as a decade ago, uh, statisticians were confidently predicting a serious problem of overpopulation in Japan. Uh, these, these projections have been uh, falsified primarily by the government-sponsored program of legalized abortion. To most Christians, however, abortion is morally offensive. The Roman Catholic Church, for example, condemns abortion as a breach of the fifth commandment. It is the taking of an innocent life and will not allow it, even as a matter of fact, even in the case of a threat to the life of the mother. 
Protestants generally allow it when the mother's life is in jeopardy, but do not condone it under ordinary circumstances. There are vast variations among Protestants on this point, as on most points, but the generalization is as close to the truth as one can get with any generalization here. It's a safe guess that sterilization is practiced fairly widely in most industrialized countries, uh, very frequently uh, under the pretext, if not explicitly for the sake, of protecting the health of the mother. The Roman Catholic Church, as you may know, is also firmly opposed to this procedure on moral grounds. While Protestants thus far have tended at least to regard the morality of sterilization as an open question, the psychological effects of sterilization also need to be studied. But I think one can say that it is at least likely that this option uh, will come up for more serious discussion as more and more people become aware of the world population crisis. And it's at least conceivable that a government-sponsored program of uh, voluntary sterilization might play some part in a program of population control. And it would seem to me, at least, to be morally preferable to a government-sponsored program of legalized abortion. Delayed marriage uh, I think we can dismiss immediately, since it's rather unrealistic to expect the uneducated peasants in the most seriously overpopulated countries of the world to please be so kind as to adopt the practice of deferring marriage and its privileges until the age of, say, 35. The, the only remaining option, therefore, uh, is some kind of contraception. Now, one of the chief obstacles, one of the chief obstacles to a worldwide program of birth control through contraception is the much publicized opposition of the Roman Catholic Church. Rome, as you know, allows the so-called rhythm method, uh, more popularly called Catholic roulette. <laughs> Up to the present time, up to the present time at least, uh, Rome has maintained that uh, artificial methods of birth control uh, are morally wrong. Rome's opposition to artificial contraception is based on the view that procreation, the bearing of children, is the natural God-given purpose of marriage and that artificial contraception constitutes a morally reprehensible frustration of this purpose. See, God gave marriage for the, for the purpose of procreation and to uh, employ artificial methods of contraception uh, is, to, is to frustrate this purpose of marriage. Uh, this has been the historic position of the Catholic Church. There is at the present time, however, uh, a great debate going on in the Roman Catholic Church. If you read, if you read any Catholic periodicals, for example, uh, you will find an immense amount of discussion of this uh, matter at the present time. There are many Catholic writers who, uh, recognizing, of course, that that a papal encyclical exists, uh, Humani Generis, in which in which. Uh, the Roman Catholic position is spelled out, and this is a statement by the, by the Pope. Uh, but they are saying, was the Pope really speaking ex cathedra when he said this? Aren't we at least free to reconsider? Can't we find some way uh, to get out of the dilemma in which we find ourselves? Uh, uh, this debate is going on. And it is at least possible, although I'm personally not very optimistic, it's at least possible that Rome will eventually permit the use of the recently perfected contraceptive pill. And this would be a tremendous boon 
to a program of worldwide population control. Actually, you see, the effects of Rome's position are much more far-reaching than you might expect. It's not just uh, Catholic families that are presented with, an, with a, a, a tremendous dilemma because of the position of the church. But far, far more serious than this is the fact that Rome's opposition has thus far frustrated almost every effort that has been attempted by this government and by other governments to take the initiative in establishing a worldwide program of population control. It's the political effect of Rome's position that is the most serious of all. It would therefore be a tremendous boon to a program of worldwide population control uh, if Rome uh, could alter her position on this point. Since the initiative for such a worldwide program must come largely from the industrialized West. And this can scarcely be achieved over the objections of a huge Catholic minority, and in many cases a majority, in all of the, of the industrialized nations. Even if this hurdle should be surmounted, however, there are many other obstacles that stand in the way of a successful program of worldwide population control. Such things as ignorance and superstition and local mores encouraging large families and so on make it extremely difficult to establish an effective program. Furthermore, not all national governments place an equally high priority on population control. So that the most that one can hope for, it seems to me, is evidence of a slight reduction in the birth rate as uh, uh, national governments and hopefully the United Nations inaugurate programs of population control. Now, whether the rate can be slowed down fast enough and far enough, and whether equilibrium can be reached soon enough, these uh, soon enough to avert the maggot-like world which we described earlier. It's impossible to say, but it seems to me that there is little cause for optimism in the present trends. Well, so much for the purely quantitative problem and as, as, an, as an ethical dimension of the population crisis. Let's look next at the qualitative dimension to the problem. This aspect of the problem can be stated like this, that the various segments of the world's population are not increasing at equal rates. And as a matter of fact, there's a great deal of evidence which shows that the feeble-minded the dull, the lower than average people of the world are outbreeding the bright, the able, the above average people at a rather or by a rather considerable margin. You all heard the old, uh, the old saw, the, the rich get richer and the poor get children. Well, there's something to this. Uh, <laughs> There's something to this. The, if, if you examine, for example, the, the uh, birth rates in the various uh, census tracts of the Twin City area, you will find that birth rates in the, in the slum areas of the city uh, are three and four times as great as the citywide average. Uh, there is a census tract over... Uh, uh, in, in North Minneapolis along Olson Highway, north of Olson Highway, uh, in the vicinity of Olson and Lindale, there is a census tract where the, where the population, where the, where the, where the, the birth rate uh, is uh, roughly 90, 90 births per thousand per year. Uh, this corresponds to a citywide birth rate of about 22 per thousand per year. See, an immensely higher birth rate. Now, part of the reason for this is that, by and large, it is the abler and the brighter and the more advanced people of the world who have availed themselves of contraceptive techniques. 
While the duller and the more backward people of the world have gone blissfully on their way, producing children at or near the biological maximum. There are, there are places in the world where uh, a young woman approaching uh, the childbearing years, uh, if she knew what she could look forward to, could look forward to uh, producing something in the vicinity of 18 or 20 children uh, during her childbearing years, unless she had the good fortune to die in childbirth before this process reached its conclusion. Once again, one can visualize contrasting alternatives. One possibility is that the present trend, aided by modern medical techniques, which ensure the survival of many of the weak, along with the fit, uh, that the present trend will continue and that the human stock will be progressively weakened. There have been studies made already to indicate that, that uh, the human stock has been substantially weakened uh, by the elimination of, uh, pr of, of certain uh, uh, natural selection processes by modern medicine. The end result could be, therefore, uh, the liquidation of the uh, bright minority by the slow-witted but powerful and numerous majority. Or it could lead, another possibility, to some kind of rigid caste system uh, with severe strictures against intermarriage or any number of other patterns of social organization, which nonetheless uh, presuppose the, the steady increase, the steady increase uh, uh, of the uh, slower-witted, the less able uh, representatives of mankind. The other possibility is that within the context of worldwide population equilibrium, procedures will be inaugurated that will reasonably assure the quality of the human stock. Uh, that somehow or other, you see, within the context of an artificial equilibrium at some optimum level, uh, procedures will be inaugurated which will, which will ensure that the human stock will not deteriorate, at least not any further, possibly even that it will improve. Once again, it seems to me there can be no serious disagreement as to which state of affairs is morally preferable. Disagreements come when you begin to consider the morality of means. Now, if the quantitative problem could be solved, thus making possible rising standards of living and rising levels of education in parts of the world that at the present time can barely maintain the status quo, it's conceivable that much could be accomplished on a purely voluntary basis. That is to say, Persons suffering from serious inheritable forms of physical defect, for example, could perhaps be persuaded to undergo voluntary sterilization, thus making sure that their inheritable defect is not passed on uh, to succeeding generations. Or to take another example, economic incentives might be applied to encourage the less able to limit their families, while the more able may be similarly encouraged to raise larger families. There is some evidence that in Sweden, for example, there is a fairly close relation between ability to provide on the one hand and family size on the other, and that the, that the close correlation is a desirable correlation. That is to say that those with the higher ability to, buy, to provide uh, generally have the larger families. Now, if then you assume an economic system in which economic prosperity bears some relation to ability, this would seem to have the desired effect. It may well be, however, that such voluntary measures cannot suffice to replace the law of the survival of the fittest which modern medicine has virtually repealed. It may well be, therefore, that in the foreseeable future, 
such things as mandatory sterilization of certain kinds of people will be seriously advocated. And the control of the quality of man's offspring may become as serious a moral problem as the control of the quantity is at the present time. Uh, the quantitative problem, you see, is the one that, that, that presently appears to be most serious. But, but if we become, if we, if we get within shooting distance of a solution of the quantitative problem, uh, I think it's safe to predict that the qualitative problem uh, will appear to be extremely serious as well. Finally, a word about what I call the distribution dimension of the problem. The human suffering that results from overpopulation and under-industrialization is, like most things, very unevenly distributed throughout the world. Uh, Michael Harrington, in his very excellent recent book, uh, The Other America, which I hope you'll also read sometime, uh, has reminded us that even in our own country, even in this land of plenty, there are millions upon millions of people, uh, some 40 or 50 million, perhaps one-fourth of our population, according to Harrington's uh, uh, criteria, who live in poverty. In other countries, in Asia and in Africa and in many parts of South America, the problem of poverty is even worse. Uh, you may just call to mind uh, one of the statistics that uh, Dr. Jensen gave you uh, last Friday, that America, with uh, that this country, the United States, with about either 6 or 7 percent of the world's population, has 40 percent of the world's real wealth. Uh, now, with poverty in this country, you can, you can uh, uh, make some estimate of the immense poverty that must exist in the poorer countries of the world. It's conceivable, therefore, that the purely Quality, the purely quantitative problem might be solved, and even the qualitative problem solved, and that we would still have in the world vast areas where only the cruel law of nature maintained population equilibrium. That is to say, we could have, we could have vast areas of, world, of the world in which the suffering and the misery which can be predicted for all men if we reach natural equilibrium, uh, would go on even within the context of an artificially established equilibrium at an optimum level. We've shown ourselves to be highly capable, for example, of ignoring the subculture of poverty in our own country. And it's not at all inconceivable that in a world of stabilized population, there should be islands of misery here and there in the midst even of a world of plenty. And should this happen, the pain and the suffering and the misery which at present threatens all of mankind given present population trends, in the foreseeable future would be reserved for those not fortunate enough to participate in the general improvement of man's lot so that the prediction of Malthus, while it might be avoided for some, uh, would still uh, come true for many millions and perhaps billions of the world's people. Once again, one hopes that even the most rabid of the free enterprisers would agree that it would be better to have a world in which even the poorest of the poor have the food and the clothing, and the shelter, and the hope necessary for a life of human dignity. But how shall this be achieved? It is with respect to this dimension of the problem, it seems to me, that Dr. Chrislock's discussion of private investment, governmental aid programs, and private and public philanthropy are relevant. Uh, if I understood Dr. Chrislock correctly uh, last Saturday, uh, he was arguing that worldwide economic improvement uh, is a, an alternative to worldwide population control. Uh, I think this is wrong. 
I think that a worldwide population, uh, worldwide economic improvement uh, only postpones the worldwide population crisis. Uh, but it is important, it is extremely important uh, as a way, as perhaps the only way, or these various ways that you talked about together, uh, constitute a necessary, a necessary procedure uh, if the distribution element of the problem uh, is ever to be solved. Economic development, I'm saying, cannot be a substitute for population control. This, it seems to me, ought to be clear. You don't solve the quantitative problem by foreign aid or domestic aid. You only defer it. But aid programs do help to eliminate the misery and the suffering which are also aggravated by uh, rapid population growth. And in this sense, aid programs augment programs for population control in some very important ways. I want to conclude, however, by re-emphasizing the quantitative problem, since that is the, that's the, that's the, first, that's, that's the first dimension and, and presently the most pressing dimension of the problem. You see, if we can't solve the quantitative problem, why everything else goes by the board. Uh, it is this, therefore, that must be attacked and solved if the maggot world that we described a while ago is to be avoided. And each of us, each of you, will inevitably play a role in the solution or the non-solution of this problem. You will play a role, for example, in the decisions that you make with respect to the size of your own family. You will play a role as a citizen in the way you cast your vote and therefore in the kinds of government programs that you support. Some of you may play a role as a teacher or as a politician which incidentally is not a bad word, or as a member of the Peace Corps, or as, for example, an employee of the government or of the United Nations. But whatever role you play, in one respect at least, your moral task and my moral task is clear, and that is to play our roles responsibly and intelligently in the light of the best information available to us. Thank you very much. I should explain that I have to rush over to help with registration, so I can't stay to hear what Dr. Hendricks is going to have to say, but you listen carefully.